Jay, thank you for that kind introduction, and I can assure you I am no Steve Young, so bring the standards down. I always wish people would introduce me as Brad as a boy from a small hometown who spent 22 years of his life dreaming of a way out and the rest of his life thinking of a way back home. Because that really is who I am. And it also understates why I'm so privileged to be here this evening with such a vibrant, innovative, fast-growing ecosystem of thought leaders and influencers right here in the Treasure Valley. And it is a real honor to have been invited to speak with you this evening. And I'm also excited to be able to share the stage with you in a few minutes with one of your very own, Matt Rissell. I'll talk more about Matt in a minute when I introduce him. But before we get to the fireside chat, I wanted to share just a few opening comments about the topic that Jay teed up a few moments ago, the topic of disruption, or more specifically, the importance of the ability to disrupt yourself. Time for little Uncle Brad's story time. It was the summer of 2016. I'm flying across the country on a business trip, reading an article in Fortune magazine written by Jeffrey Colvin entitled How the Best Business Leaders Disrupt Themselves. And it was the opening sentence of the article that caught my attention. Why isn't Intuit dead? Now you might imagine as a sitting CEO of Intuit at the time, I felt compelled to read that article. <laughs> if for no other reason, career preservation. As I got into the article, he went on to say, the answer is easy to state, but it's hard to emulate. It's because Intuit serially disrupts itself. Something only a handful of companies have been able to do. Companies like Amazon, Netflix, and Intuit. And Jeff went on to say he studied these companies and he's learned their three characteristics they all share. First, they view their businesses the way a disruptor would see them coming out of a dorm room or a garage. Second, they have the courage to drive change even when their business is performing well. And third, they do this time and time again. Now, Jeff was intrigued enough that he reached out and placed a call to me and he said, would you mind if I came to your location and shadowed your employees, watched how leaders make decisions and how you create this environment? And we were blown away. And I said, of course, come out. It's perfect timing. We're starting our new fiscal year. We have this event called the State of the Company where we have all 9,000 employees around the globe dial in through video from every country around the world. And we go through our innovation techniques where every single employee, whether you're in finance or legal or HR or engineering, they go out and they observe customers in their natural environments. They look for problems getting in their customer's way. They come back, they develop a hypothesis, they run an experiment, and by the end of the day, they know whether their idea has merit or not. Come and observe that happen. And he did. And then unbeknownst to us, he planned to write a follow-up article. He did that in the fall of 2017. And in that article, Jeffrey Colvin answered his own question. Why is Intuit continually able to disrupt itself? It's because it operates as a 36-year-old startup. And it treats every employee in the company as a leader, an owner, and an entrepreneur. And those employees are challenged to look at the company every day as if it's day one, and to fall in love with the problems that the customers have and not the products that the company has produced. And that was an exciting article to read, but it was the way he finished the article that really jumped out at me. He said, let me just put the facts on the table. Intuit is the Tom Brady of their industry, performing at the peak of their game at an age when everyone else they played with retired. Now, I don't care what your football loyalties are, that's pretty high compliments, and so we were excited and we'll take it. So how do you create an environment where every employee and every leader is willing to serially disrupt themselves? Well, I'll be honest with you, it takes a lot of work. Because on an individual basis, everyone is for change until it happens to them. And on a company basis, there's a reason why the most popular joke in the technology industry is, do you know why the Almighty was able to create heaven and earth in seven days? because he didn't have legacy technology and an install base of customers to migrate. <laughs> With all due respect, I know you can do it, but the point is clear. Change is inevitable. It can happen to you or it can happen through you and it's your choice. And what I'd like to do is just share three very quick tips that we've learned over 36 years of hard knocks and scar tissue that enable us to try every day to be a 36-year-old startup. And the first begins with leadership. President John F. Kennedy, speechwriter, once said, a dealer, excuse me, a leader needs to be better than a good communicator. 
a leader needs to be a translator of dreams. When you talk about change, everyone says you need a burning platform. And a burning platform is important, but it's not sufficient. People don't want to run from something. They want to run to something. And that's the job of a leader, to be a dealer of hope, to paint the art of the possible and to create a vision of a better tomorrow and to show everyone in the organization the role they play in making that vision a reality. The second tip to being a serial disruptor is to measure success in the only way that matters, through the eyes of your customer. A brand is not what you tell your customers, your company, or your product does. A brand is what your customers tell their friends and family members, what your product or your company does. And so what's interesting is 36 years ago, our founder, Scott Cook, observed his wife, Signe, struggle to balance the family, family finances. He said, there has to be a better way. And we have been in love with that problem every day since. We've served it with DOS computing. Yes, we've been around that long. Windows, the web, the cloud, social, mobile, global, and now we're an AI-driven expert platform. And we're still on a vision quest to solve that problem. So only measure success in the way that matters, which is through the eyes of the customer. That takes me to my third and final tip. When driving change and reinventing yourself, be clear about what won't change. Employees joined your company for a reason. They fell in love with something. They saw themselves in something that you do. So while you should challenge everything, you should be clear about what won't change. And for us, it's our mission, it's our values, and it's the fact that we're willing to continually disrupt ourselves every day to be better for our customers. Now I'm going to put a bow around it and say that change is always exciting to talk about, but the deep-seated fear that most of us have is can we become the version we aspire to be without losing the core of who we are in the process? And I know that is possible, and it's evidenced tonight by two Hall of Fame inductees, Idaho National Laboratory, J.R. Simplot, two organizations that have reimagined the future, energy, materials, security, agriculture. They have changed the world we live in and yet preserved that thing that has made them special for so many years. But I also know it because of my mommy. She still lives in the same house in a little town in West Virginia that I'll go visit on Friday. 80 years old, I'll knock on the door, she'll open the door, and our greeting will go the same way every time. We'll both get tears in our eyes. She'll give me a kiss. And she'll say, honey, it's so good to see you. Your GI Joes are in the back bedroom in the toy chest. <laughs> and I smile at my mom, and in my head I'm saying, I'm 55 years old with gray hair and wrinkles and two girls who've graduated college. And I look at her and I say, Mom, I haven't played with those GI Joes in years. And she says, I know, but I remember how happy they made you, and I've kept them just in case. When my mom looks in my eyes, she doesn't see this. She sees the same soul she gave birth to so many years ago. And it reminds me, you can become another version of you without losing who you are. Thank you. And I'm now excited to bring up one of your very own, Matt Rissell, a leader who not only has changed the face of what you're doing here, but has changed me as a human being and the way that he and Robin and their family interact and has changed our company culture. He's a leader, he's a friend, he's a mentor. Matt Russell. It is great to see everybody here. Brad, it is an honor. I'm digging the beard, man. You've been hunting or what? Can, uh, can you guys hear me through this nasty thing? <laughs> can you, no one even knows who I am. Everyone was like, who is the psycho with the big, the big beard and the, and the bald head? It's good. Yeah, yeah. Looks good on you. <laughs> well, um, Brad, I, uh, I, I couldn't be more excited to have you here. Um, you. I know Brad uh, really well. I was going to say intimately, but I won't say that. But for, for about 10 years, and I've got to watch you um, do unbelievable things at Intuit. In fact, just so everybody knows, I mean, when, you, when you, uh, you become a business leader and you start studying different mentors across the world, um, Brad was somebody that I started to study. And he actually became one of my business heroes. And so to sit up, sit here, have you in Boise, Idaho, and be able to, uh, to just have a conversation with you is truly one of, uh, one of my dreams. Thank you, Matt. To start off, All right. I'm gonna change up our questions just a little bit here. And um, 
I want everyone to understand some of the things that Brad has done so that the, so that the weight of his answers can really hopefully resonate. As a, in 11 years as CEO, there are a lot of small businesses owner here that think, I would love to grow my company a million dollars, grow the market cap a million dollars. Some of them, their dream is to grow it $10 million. In 11 years, you took the value of Intuit from 10 billion to $50 billion. Mm. That is unbelievable. How did you do it? I didn't, we did. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. First of all, Matt, that's kind of you to say, and I especially loved uh, and appreciated your opening comments. So thank you for saying all those things. You know, it's interesting for a business leader at any size organization, you have to be really clear about how to measure success because a lot of things are gonna change in your environment. And I'll go back to my opening comments. It's really important to measure success through the eyes of the customer. And so we think about things that into it like market cap, stock price, revenue as output metrics, or we call them vanity metrics. And instead, we try to put our energy into the input metrics that are real predictors of customer satisfaction and long-term growth. And you know we call these succession metrics, which is depending upon the size of the company and where you are, you have to be really clear as a leader what questions to ask your teams. So if they have an idea, the power of ideas, and they're about to start, we never ask them a single question about how big could this be. We simply say, have you come up with an idea that solves the customer's problem better than anything else they have? The second is, are they actively using your idea? And the third is, are they already talking about, talking about it with friends and family members? We call those love metrics. The only thing we ask about in terms of a business number at that point is, do you ever think anybody will pay us for this? That's it. And then we go through the next stage, and the next stage is cohorts, and that is, do you get those love metrics with every version you produce, do they go up? Does the customer benefit improve? Does the active use increase? Does the word of mouth expand? And then the second question we ask when they're at the cohort stage is, have you run a test where we just see if they'd be willing to give us a credit card? And then we go to the third, and the third is market success. And that's where you measure those three love metrics against all the alternatives in the market. And you wanna make sure yours are better than theirs. And only at that point do we start to actually measure whether someone will pay us. The, fat, the last is chapter four, and those are the financial metrics. And that's where you measure customer base, that's where you measure revenue and profit. I say that to say the conversations that we have in our business meetings, as you know, are about how happy are customers, are they using the product? Are they telling everybody? Oh yeah, and the cash register is ringing along the way. That's the important way to try to scale a business from 10 billion to 50 billion. Did you guys write that down? <laughs> um, I have shorter answers, I promise. No, that's, I mean, that's incredible. And that's why we're here. We're here to learn from you. And so, yeah. um, I mean, that's an incredible formula. Let's start a little bit with your background. Okay. So you grew up in a small town in West Virginia, like what you had said. and. You always believed in the strength of community. You, you even got a black belt in karate. And mm. so be careful uh, just when you shake his hand. <laughs> yeah. But how would you say your upbringing helped shape who you are today, including its impact on your success today? Oh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, we are the product of everyone who invested in us. And so for me, I grew up in a little town called Canova, West Virginia, population 3,000 if you count the cows. Um, Wonderful mom and dad, two brothers, uh, families, uh, friends that have lasted a lifetime. But there were actually three formative moments that shaped who I am. And the first was at the age of six, I was sitting and watching television with my brothers and a news flash scrolled across the screen that said a plane had crashed at the Tri-State Airport. And the only thing my little town of 3000 had was the Tri-State Airport. So I ran and looked out my bedroom window and the mountain was glowing and we found out it was carrying the Marshall University football team. And at the age of six, I watched a community rise from the ashes. And Eleanor Roosevelt once said, we're all born angels with one wing, and the way we learn to fly is by holding on to one another. And I watched a community come together and rise from those ashes. And I really learned that life's a team sport. Mm. The second was fourth grade. I had a crush on a little redheaded girl. She beat me in a spelling bee. She wrote me the note the next day that said, you can't be my boyfriend because you're stupid. <laughs> Very insightful young lady who's gone on to become a pediatrician, so she was very smart. 
But I went home that night, my IQ didn't go up, but my work ethic did. And I've come to believe intelligence is simply applied effort. And then the third moment was in the ninth grade when I had a good friend that I'd gone from kindergarten to ninth grade who was in boxing, Golden Gloves boxing, and he began to practice his skills not on the equipment but on his friends, and he became a bully. I stood up to him and I lost. And I was embarrassed, and I went home to see my dad and mom and brothers and thought they would ask me to sleep in a tent outside. And my dad looked me in the eye with the most sympathy and caring I can remember, and he said, uh, I've never been more proud of you because courage isn't the absence of fear, it's a willing to stand up, a willingness to stand up and face it. And then he enrolled me in martial arts. <laughs> and I learned at that moment that it's important to face the things that scare you the most because they probably aren't as bad as you think. And if you do have the capability, stand up for those who need a champion and may feel like they're in a victimized sort of situation. So that's who I am now. I believe life's a team sport. I believe intelligence is applied effort. And I believe at the end of the day that you have to stand up to the things that scare you the most and just lean into the wind. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about leaders who have shaped you. I mean, yeah. you, you hear this all the time. Um, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. But whether uh, your early years at Pepsi or ADP, and during your time at Silicon Valley, you have deliberately surrounded yourself with business executives that you choose to learn from. Can you identify a few of those who you admire most and what you admire about those individuals? Oh, this is easy. Well, I'll start with you. Oh. I've, I've learned a ton from you, and I, and I can tell you, when I first met you, it was your intellectual curiosity, your humility, and your grit. And I think those are the three characteristics that anybody should ever want to have if they want to achieve great things. Um, I had learned from my mother and father the strength of character. I learned from Scott Cook, our founder, intellectual curiosity and the willingness to be obsessed with the customer. Bill Campbell, the famous trillion dollar coach, they've just written a book about him. He was the coach to Larry and Sergey and Eric Schmidt, to Steve Jobs, to Jeff Bezos, to myself. And he taught me the power of being a coach and a multiplier. But I would say that the lesson I've learned most is from my wife, a servant leader, someone who made a choice her choice to step down from a very successful career and invest everything she had in our daughters. And uh, one time I came home from a business trip six months after she made that decision and she was sitting at the table with tears in her eyes and I said, what's wrong, one of the girls hurt? And she said, no, um, I just don't know if I'm important anymore. And I said, what do you mean? She said, because I'm just a mother. And I wrote her a poem. Do you mind if I read it? Yeah. I actually carry this all the time. This is not staged, but I do carry it all the time, and I carry it in my wallet. Uh, by the way, I don't claim to be a good poet, and I'm not a quarterback in the NFL, so we'll get those two things out. This was written in September 1999. The value one contributes is measured carefully. It's quantified and counted to measure your legacy. The fear she harbors deep inside is the judgment of another. After all, her contribution is that she's just a mother. The children rushed and hurried will choose heroes to admire. Some strong, some fast, all valiant when the situations are dire. How can she measure up to that? She sits aside and wonders. She has to be more worthy than simply just a mother. The hours can be long and dark when friendships become few. It is a lonely journey when your dreams are not pursued. The passions that she held yesterday, she struggles now to smother. For there's no time for I or me when you are just a mother. Tomorrow's greatest treasures are now upon their way to building higher castles than can be found today. A sister with her sister, like me and all my brothers, were taught life's greatest lessons by simply just a mother. To view such selfless sacrifice will humble all who see that all the things we do each day just will not ever be as great a contribution as one who lives for others, as one who gives her best each day to simply be a mother. So when the dust is settled and all the tallies are done, the ones who do the counting are the ones who came forth from her sacrifice and her selflessness, and that is why we love her. There are no heroes great or small more grand than just a mother. Wow. I say that because like you, I look around and see a lot of people that I would love to be more like. It used to be called plagiarism, now it's called benchmarking. <laughs> President Trump, I want to be clear about that. 
<laughs> but if you think about the true essence of leadership, it's the sacrifice that parents often make for their children so that they can reach higher heights. So that's who I want to be. I want to be a mother. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, it's, you know, what's interesting about that is that, is that you know, um, underneath all of that is the identity, you know, the identity we wrap, and, uh, wrap up and what we do versus who we are, right? And, yeah. and uh, we'll get to that in a second, actually, when we talk a little bit about, about your transition. But spe you know, speaking, I want to stay on that vein a little bit, and about leadership and coaching. Yes. So I want to hear what your philosophy is, is on leadership and mentorship. You had... 10,000 employees. Mm -hmm. You had something like, I think, 5,000 different partners. Mm -hmm. We came in in 2012. I think we had maybe 15 employees at, at the time. And we were tiny. I mean, we were just, we were, we were tiny. And <laughs> you weren't. <laughs> Anytime I stand next to him, I feel like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. I was oh, like geez. twins. <laughs> um, <sighs> Where well, were you? It was a great question. <laughs> You had me at hello. <laughs> the, uh, your philosophy on mentorship. Yeah. You took a meeting from me. Now, you know, everyone out there, there's been times you've probably reached out to somebody you really want to learn from. You really want to have this meeting with them. Well, that was Brad Sith to me back in 2012, right? We had just launched our partnership. And I got an intro from somebody that you had, had known from a long time ago because I worked really hard to get that mm -hmm. introduction, right? And you said yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, if you were to take all 10,000 employees, if they wanted to meet with you, you wouldn't have time. Mm -hmm. How do you choose? What is your philosophy on mentorship? How do you choose what meetings you take, what meetings you don't take? And then, and then, um, and then what is your strategy when you invest into them? Well, let me talk a little bit about leadership. And we spend a lot of time talking about this at Into It. Your title makes you a manager. People will decide if you're a leader. And you can win minds one to many. You win hearts one to one. And so it's really important to understand that when someone has enough courage to ask you for some time, that that's an opportunity for you to cultivate that opportunity and that idea and that individual. And so one of the greatest lessons I learned about leadership was actually when my youngest daughter was going to join a soccer club when she was nine years old and we lived in Atlanta. And most kids had started playing at the age of three and by the age of nine they were built, bending it like Beckham. And so being helicopter parents that we were, we got her in a special league that were late bloomers so she wouldn't be embarrassed and lose her confidence and she would get a participation trophy. And we bought her a whole new uniform and we bought her a ball and we wrote her name in magic marker like all the parents did. And we showed up 10 minutes before practice and the kids were out there kicking the ball and the parents were talking and all of a sudden there was crying and there were people who had grass stains on their new uniform and the <laughs> marker was smudged. And the parents had no idea how to deal with this and this coach showed up got out of the SUV with a net over one shoulder and equipment over the other, put the net at the end of the field and came over to drop the equipment. And every kid on the field turned to that net and began to kick all the soccer balls into the net as quickly as they could. And it didn't matter whose they were. They all went in, they high-fived each other like they won the World Cup. And that's when I knew what leadership was. Be clear what success is and get the hell off the field. <laughs> that's it. Because the greatness is already in somebody. And then what you do as a coach is you cultivate that individual ability and you teach them how to have some team capability by teaching them plays. But 90% of success is just saying, this is what success looks like. Go let your freak flag fly. Go do it. And that's you. I mean, you'd already built something. I wanted to learn from you. You had built a company from nothing. And that was exciting. So that's why I took the meeting with you. Wow. Well, um, thank you for those. Thank you for those You're kind welcome. words. And, um, and, and you did, you invested more than a, more time that you allotted during that meeting and then took meetings um, um, even as we, as we moved on. And, yeah. and I can easily say that T-Sheets and what we built here that is now a part of Intuit, um, uh, there's a lot of what I, that I instilled inside of that company, I gleaned from you. And a lot of those things about leadership and mentorship, I tried to, I tried to pass on. And so they, they carry forward. And now there's 10,000 employees that really have taken those principles. And Sasan as the CEO has yeah. really continued on and taken that mantle even further. Well, we have a mantra. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. And so that's the thing we always have to remember in a leadership role. And the other thing is, Bill Campbell, the famous trillion dollar coach, once said to me, when I look at you, I see two people, the person you are today and the person you're capable of being. And I want to introduce those two people. And that's what a coach does. They don't judge you, they cultivate you. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's a wonderful testament to what we try to do together with each other. Awesome. All right, let's switch gears again a little bit. All right, I'm ready. Let's go back to disruption. Okay, let's go back to disruption. You said that um, you talked a little bit about how you disrupted yourself when you, and, and how you learned about that when you were uh, flying in the plane. Yes. When you became CEO. Yes. The iPhone had just came out, or if it was just, if it hadn't, it was just getting ready to come out. Right. And then you had to convince the company to reinvent itself when you were already number one. Mm. How did you convince the company to really want to reinvent itself when you were already number one? This is the brilliant thing when you're taught in the fourth grade that you're not that smart. <laughs> you don't have to convince the company, the company has to convince itself. And so what I was able to do was to come in and say, I wanna understand from employees, from our board members, from fellow CEOs in the tech industry, from competitors, when you look at into it, what's the greatest untapped opportunity you see before us? And at that time, Facebook had just moved out of schools and into dot com. The iPhone had just been invented. People were moving to the cloud. There were a lot of things happening and we were absolutely strong in desktop, but we needed to reimagine ourselves. So I said, what are the biggest untapped opportunities? The second question I asked is what are the greatest risks that if we don't prepare ourselves could put us out of business? And the third is what's the single biggest thing I could do to screw it up? And what was amazing was the themes were very consistent. You need to be a cloud company. You need to embrace social platforms, mobile devices, and global expansion. And that became the rally cry, which was we're going to be a connected services company with social, mobile, global. And every employee thought they wrote it because every employee had a voice. And then we said, guess what? I have no idea how to do this. So we adopted 10% time. Google has 20% time. We gave 10% time to all employees to use that time to run experiments to figure out how to do that. Within 90 days, the first version of TurboTax on the mobile phone was launched. Three years later, 1,800 experiments and $400 million in revenue produced by employees that no one in the CEO staff ever thought of. That's how we did it. The employees did it, not me. I just asked the questions. Incredible. I bet there's a whole lot of companies in Boise, Idaho that start off uh, next week with 10% time in their companies. <laughs> it's magic. Just put the soccer net at the end of the field and get off the field. Well, two final questions sure. here as we wrap up. Work-life balance. A lot of times when you see a really successful CEO and I read about them, there's, there's a lot of things that I try to glean from them. And then when you look at their personal life, it's you're like, well, uh, I'm gonna learn from them as a business leader, not necessarily as a father, let's say, or husband. When I've looked at your life, I've learned from you both as a business leader and as a father and husband. Thank you. How do you do the work-life balance? Uh, first of all, I found someone who was much better than me that was willing to grade me on a curve. That's my wife. <laughs> but secondly, I learned two important lessons. One was a lesson from Bill Campbell, who said that there are times of war and there are times of peace. Good generals know what time it is. And so even in school, if you have exams, you have to say to your friends, I can't go to that sorority or fraternity party. I've got to hit the books. And then after that, you can go have some fun. Same thing at work. You've got to kind of know when you've got to sacrifice one way or the other. But then the question is, when do you make sure you don't sacrifice the wrong things? And I have a notion called crystal moments and rubber moments. Rubber moments are those things when your daughter is in 17 dance recitals and you have to miss one because of a board meeting. And she's going to be upset, but I know there's 16 more and she'll forget about it the next time. But then there's that one homecoming or one prom or one birth of a baby or a wedding and if you drop it, it shatters. Don't ever prioritize work over a crystal moment and if a company wants you to do it, choose a different company. Incredible. And lastly, self-reinvention. So you <laughs> recently transitioned. You too. Well, yeah. Let's talk about you. All so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from CEO to, you know, global CEO, running a Fortune 500 company to chairman of the board. Yeah. Um, what's next for you and how have you glided through the transition? I'll give you a tip. I just posted an article this past Tuesday on LinkedIn called How to Discover Your Why. And the reason why I tell you that is because I'm going to give you a short version of this story. But it has been a process, even when you plan it yourself, Ultimately, there's a realization you didn't expect. Mark Twain once said the two most important days in your life are the day that you're born and the day you discover why. 
And I've needed to be on a search for my why again. I've had to look back over my lifetime at things I've sacrificed that I now want to prioritize higher. I've looked back at the points in my life when I was filled with the most passion and purpose. I've thought about the environments where I'm not at my best self and the environments when I am. And the answers have become clear. I want to be a champion for the overlooked and underserved. I want to be a warrior for human dignity and human potential. And I want to level the playing field of opportunity in those communities where everyone else figures their best days are behind them. So I'm leaning into Appalachia and West Virginia with both entrepreneurship and education. And we're going to put a foundation together, my wife and I, called One Wing, Angels with Only One Wing. And we're trying to go into these communities with Silicon Valley techniques to tell these kids, you can indeed be the next Mark Zuckerberg or the Mark, next Larry or Sergey or the next Matt Rissell. That's my dream. I hope one day that we get to say the next president of the United States is. <laughs> Steve Young. Everybody, thank you very much, Brad Smith.